Welcome to On Cue Insight. On today's show, John Heyman, Executive Director of the Mauer County Historical Society, talks about Minnesota's involvement in what he calls Minnesota's two civil wars, one as part of Union forces and one as the battleground for the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862. Join us as we learn more about our past on On Cue Insight. Minnesota's involvement in the Civil War. We all know enough of uh, our own history to know that by the start of the 1860s, you know, the United States is poised on the brink of secession. And Abraham Lincoln's election pretty much drives that train right over the tracks. Um, the, south, the southern states begin seceding. The war actually begins in April 1861 when South Carolina bombards Fort Sumter from Charleston Harbor. Now, Minnesota, at this point in its history, is a very young state. Minnesota is only three years old by this point. Um, as it so happened, Minnesota becomes the first state in the Union to offer troops for federal service as a result of the war. Anybody know why? Why is the youngest state also the first one to volunteer? The governor happened to be in Washington, D.C. when Sumter was bombarded. Alexander Ramsey was actually in D.C. on April the 14th when Lincoln issued his call for 75,000 troops for federal service to put down the rebellion. Ramsey immediately tenders the offer of 1,000 troops from Minnesota. Now, at this point, an important thing to remember is the military operates on a completely different system in 1861 than it does today. In fact, than it did at any point in the 20th century, which is simply this, that each state maintains its own independent militia, which are the forerunners of today's National Guard. So when the federal government decided that it needed to increase the size of the regular army in order to put down the war in the South, they did not simply pass a bill in Congress authorizing for an expansion of the regular army, they had to assign an allocation amount to each separate state. Which is why, as we'll see as the war goes on, the manning, manpower requirements from each state differ based on each state's population. So Minnesota offers a thousand of its own troops. Now, one of those arguments that quickly develops that usually only historians really get excited about or care deeply about is who was actually the very first individual in Minnesota to volunteer for federal service in the war. Anoka County's Historical Society has maintained for about 150 years that it was this man, Aaron Greenwald of Anoka, who was a flour miller with a fabulous head of hair, you have to admit. <laughs> I know women today who would kill for that kind of a coif. <laughs> In point of fact, the historical evidence supports the idea that the man on the left, Josiah King, a resident of St. Paul, was in fact the first person to enlist only because of the fact that a telegraph line reached St. Paul, but there was no telegraph line in that era that actually went north from the state capital up to the area of Anoka County. So for anybody in Anoka County to have gotten the word that there was a call for federal troops, the message would have had to have been carried by stage or by horse. And therefore, it's assumed that nobody there really knew that there had been a call put out until the next day. People in St. Paul knew a day earlier, which is why Josiah King's claim to being the man to make it first is probably legitimate. Now, Minnesota responded not just with an agreement to the call for troops, Minnesota also responded with a huge wave of national patriotism and pride. How many of you know or have seen the Mower County Civil War flag that we have at the Historical Society? That's a remarkable piece of history. And if you've never seen it, I really encourage you to come over and take a look at it. One of the things that makes it so remarkable is that 
the Civil War flag that the company from Mower County carried to the war was not one that was issued to them by the Army or by the government. It was one that was purchased as a private purchase by women from Austin who, when they discovered there were no flags for sale in Mower County, traveled up to St. Paul, bought the flag, and brought it back here so it could be presented before the troops left. Now, in this case, this is the national flag made by the ladies of Reed's Landing in Wabasha County. And if you look really closely, you'll notice that the red stripes are not all quite the same shade. That's not because they have faded over time. That's because they sewed the flag from any types of red cloth they could get their hands on in a hurry. So the first regiment from Minnesota that goes off to the National Army is the first Minnesota Volunteer Regiment. And just to be clear, I've shortened the military terminology as I go through this presentation. Every one of Minnesota's units that fought in the war were by definition a volunteer unit. The Federal Army at this point, the regular Army, is extremely small. When war breaks out, the active duty U.S. Army is less than 7,000 men strong. Before the war is over, almost a million men are in uniform at one point or another. Right? Now the bulk of those soldiers were never on, they were never regular army troops. They were state militia or volunteer troops who were federalized for active service with the army. So all of Minnesota's regiments, and there were 13 infantry regiments, are by definition the whatever number Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment. We'll just call them the 1st Minnesota, the 2nd Minnesota, or whatever, okay? Governor Ramsey, on the 14th of April, offers the federal government the use of the 1st Minnesota. What's the problem, though? 1st Minnesota doesn't exist except on paper. There actually aren't a thousand troops in uniform in Minnesota. In fact, there was a very lofty title that the state government had conferred a few years earlier called the Major General of the 2nd Division of the State Militia which was a great title for a guy who actually didn't command a pen. First person to ever hold that title, by the way, was Henry Sibley. So the companies that were formed basically came from the local militias in places like St. Paul, Stillwater, Minneapolis, Wabasha, Winona, and etc. And this picture is taken in front of the post commander's house at Fort Snelling. Those are the officers and the ladies of the 1st Minnesota after it's been formed. And if you look, most of the women are wearing those, shall we say, substantial hoop skirts, which we would require you to turn sideways so you could get through the door. <coughs> this is Company D of the 1st Minnesota. Anybody driven down Nicolette Avenue recently? It's not a dirt road today, in case you're wondering. <laughs> This is one of the most interesting units formed out of Minnesota. This is Company G of the 9th Minnesota, late in the war. And this photo is taken at the White Earth Chippewa Ojibwe Reservation. And the bulk of the company were actually, in fact, Ojibwe Indians. This almost never gets noted in history for some reason. This is Company E of the 8th Minnesota, as they're getting ready to leave Fort Snelling the second year of the war. That's an important event in Minnesota because these guys mustered in, enlisted, shipped out just before one of the pivotal events in the, in the state's history. <coughs> now, if you take all of Minnesota's participation altogether, it actually exceeds everything that's on this screen. All, right? all I've done was list the highlights of campaign credit and the battles that Minnesota's regiments fought in. And this includes the 1st through the 13th Volunteer Infantry Regiments, plus three, infantry, uh, three regiments of Volunteer Cavalry, three regiments of Volunteer Artillery, and a couple of Service and Support Units. These, on the left, are all from the Civil War itself. The ones on the right up here are from where? Minnesota, from the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, which is by necessity an offshoot of the Civil War and is often referred to as Minnesota's other Civil War. Now, there are two highlights down there that I've written out, one of which is the fact that the first Minnesota, to this day, 
still holds the American record for a unit to have suffered the highest percentage of casualties in one day's action of any unit in American military history, ever. And that was on the second day of Gettysburg. The 8th Minnesota traveled more miles than any other unit, Confederate or Union, in the Civil War. They were all over the place. Everybody get long enough to read through that? Okay. Now the 1st Minnesota, rightfully so, is probably the most famous of all of Minnesota's regiments that served in the war. And most of it comes from one event. Now mind you, the 1st Minnesota, by the time they have their moment of, as the poet would call it, death and glory in Gettysburg in 1863, they're already seasoned veterans by this point. They have fought at Antietam. They have been at Ball's Bluff, Seven Pines, First Manassas. Sorry, that's, I'm from the South. We in the South call all the battles by different names. First Bull Run, as you Yankees say. Um, they are veterans of incredible experience. Their moment comes on the second day of the Battles of Gettys Battle of Gettysburg, 1863 when the Union line is in danger of being turned. And what's needed is time. And so their Corps commander, General Winfield Scott Hancock, basically simply gives the 1st Minnesota's regimental commander an order to attack a Confederate unit that is five times their size. With no expectation of winning, with no attempt to throw the Confederates back, it's only to buy enough time to allow more Federal troops to be brought up and hold their position. And so, five to one odds, the first Minnesota does. They take up a line along Plum Run, which is a creek in Gettysburg, and then they counterattack. And they actually, essentially, it's, imagine a, a hamster attacking an elephant. But the reality is, is that it works. It does. It, it holds the Confederate advance. In fact, the Confederate commander on the other side later said that had his request for more troops to support him been fulfilled, then they would have been able to push the first Minnesota back and they would have taken uh, the federal flank, which would have ended the Battle of Gettysburg right there on the second day as a Confederate victory. So much so is this a fact that years after the fact, President Coolidge remembers it by saying that the eight companies of the first Minnesota are entitled to call themselves the saviors of their country. Right? But to give you an idea of what it cost them, they suffered 82% casualties. If you take more than 50% casualties, you're considered combat ineffective. If you take more than 75%, you're considered to be wiped out. Right. And that's not where their participation in the battle ended. The third day, the very next day after this, they have been pulled out of the line and they're placed along the top of the ridge in the center of the federal line where it is assumed that they will be likely under no immediate threat. What happens in the center of the federal line on the third day of Gettysburg? Pickett's charge. So the first Minnesota finds itself holding the federal line again and suffered 17 more casualties on the third day of the battle. Now, this is one of those interesting events where 150 odd years of history catch up with us today. This is the uh, Confederate battle flag of the 28th Virginia Infantry Volunte uh, Volunteer Infantry. So this is a Confederate unit. And by the way, if anybody of you are interested in current events, this was never the national flag of the Confederacy, ever. The first national flag of the Confederacy was the one that I had on the screen for my opening slide, if any of you noticed. And if you're curious, I'll go back and show it to you again at the end. But this was the battle flag that most Confederate regiments carried in the flag. Um, Private Marshall of the 1st Minnesota captured this on the third day of Gettysburg when the Confederate line breached at Pickett's Charge. In 1990, the state of Minnesota was sued by people from Virginia demanding the flag back. <laughs> the Minnesota Attorney General said, no, nah, sorry, you don't have a case. And speaking as both a Southerner and a professional historian, I agree. Trophy fairly fought, fairly won. You don't have to give it back to anybody. You keep it. So. <laughs> there are two 
two monuments to the first Minnesota at Gettysburg. This is the larger and more famous of the, of the two. I'm sure a couple of you probably have seen it in person, right? Okay. Now, you probably didn't notice in that first picture that I showed, the painting of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg, um, quite a few of the men in the picture had these little trifoils pinned to the side of their hat. This is one of the first instances of uh, military insignia being used by different units in the U.S. Army. In the ca this case, it's the insignia for the Second Corps. And this little collection here from the Minnesota State Historical Society just shows you the different variations. Some men made their own, like the one at the bottom, which is essentially stamped out of uh, German silver, nickel. Some people had seamstresses sew them one. And then some are much more elaborate and are mass produced. This is another famous painting of Minnesota in the war. This is the Battle of Nashville, in which the 5th and the 9th Minnesota Infantry um, charged across the cornfields below Shy Hill. Has anybody ever seen the original of this painting? It's an incredible piece of art. It hangs in the state capitol in the governor's area of the state capitol. This is the uh, illustrator Howard Pyle, who is one of my favorite artists. Uh, this is him working on it in 1905. I forgot. I have a collection of these things myself, and I was going to bring them and pass them around so you guys could see and feel the weight of an actual Confederate or just a Civil War bullet. Uh, these are mini balls, mostly mini balls, collected from the battlefield at Gettysburg. How many of you have ever fired a 22 caliber rifle? Right. Most of us have. 22 is the standard NATO size cartridge today. 5.56 millimeter, 223 caliber, tiny little bullet with a whole lot of velocity because it's got a massive cartridge case behind it. Those are 58 caliber. That's more than half an inch in diameter. And the older muskets that some of the volunteer regiments were using fired a 61 caliber ball. That's bigger than my thumb. A low velocity ball traveling subsonic explains why there's so much massive trauma to most people when they get hit with these things. And medicine, as you can imagine, is rudimentary. All right? So if you're unlucky enough to wind up in a casualty collection point, then your odds of survival diminish greatly depending on you know, where you're struck and how. There's one of the Minnesota Volunteer Regiments, I believe it's the 12th. The 12th Minnesota Volunteers actually lost seven times as many men to disease as they did to combat casualties. I think their, their numbers during the war were they only lost 17 men to battle deaths, but they lost 170 something to just to disease. So. Now, while the war to preserve the Union is going on, the war comes home to Minnesota very directly in another way. This photograph is taken in 1863 uh, during the punitive campaign led by General Sully and Alfred Sully and General Henry Sibley into the Dakota Territory pursuing the Dakota holdouts after the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. This individual, Lieutenant Thomas Gere, is an interesting fellow. He is involved in both the fighting in Minnesota against the Dakota and the Civil War proper. He wins the Medal of Honor at the Battle of Nashville. But before that, he was a 19-year-old second lieutenant at Fort Ridgely, out there towards, uh, Fort Ridgely is in Nicolette County, if I remember correctly, Renville or Nicolette County, one of the two, along the Minnesota River. As luck would have it, on August the 18th, the day that the U.S. Dakota War breaks out and the Dakota Indians attack the lower agency at Redwood, Gear is left in command of Fort Ridgely. He's 19 years old. He's got 20 regular soldiers in garrison because the rest of the command has either gone to, Fort, uh, to the lower agency under Captain Marsh, or they've been detached and have marched north with Lieutenant Sheehan, who's a much older and experienced soldier. Gear is left in charge. But he's laid up. Why? He's got the mumps. 
his great pivotal moment in history arrives, and he's got the flipping mumps. So he's walking around looking like a chipmunk. He's pretty much out for the cause. Two years later, he comes back and redeems himself in no small way by winning the Medal of Honor at Nashville. So the war in Minnesota, the actual fighting itself, only lasts for six weeks. The trials themselves start immediately afterwards. The army is involved with every step of this process. The trials run from September the 28th to November the 3rd. And as many of you know, some of you will have heard another presentation I gave on it. Um, 303 Dakota Indians are sentenced to death after presidential review. 38 sentence, 39 sentences are confirmed. One man receives a last minute reprieve and the other 38 are hanged at Mankato the day after Christmas, 1862, in what is not the largest mass execution in U.S. history, as many people describe it, but what is absolutely the largest simultaneous execution in American history. Now, Mower County's involvement with that particular event, all of that happened far west of us. Nothing involving the Dakota War actually came home to here. But this is Tyope. Oh. Exactly. This is the man for whom Tyope Town in Mower County is named for. He settled in Mower County after the war. He was one of about 73 um, Dakota that were permitted to remain in the state after the rest of the tribe was expelled and sent into exile. This is a great photograph. <clears throat> and one of the things that makes the, the Civil War such a fascinating war to study is that Let's not forget, photography is in its, in its infancy at this point in history. Less than 10 years earlier, before the outbreak of the Civil War, the British had fought in the Crimean. And it's in the Crimean War where photography first becomes part of the historical record on a grand scale. There are no such things as action photographs or combat photographs during this time. <laughs> Uh, the fact that you have to leave the shutter open as long as you do means that there's no such thing as a moving photograph. But you can get incredibly detailed photographs like this one. So this is a winter encampment of the second Minnesota. And by the way, armies tried not to fight during the winter as much as possible during this stage. This is a kind of a rare photograph because it shows the regiment completely drawn up. Each line of men are one company. Now what this means is that a company back then was considerably smaller than a company would be today. Part of that is dictated by the fact that you can only command and control what you can see. So if you're a company grade officer, a captain or a major, you are only controlling a battlefront that is about as wide as this room. So an entire regiment in the field will only muster around 800 to 1200 men. A regiment today is closer to about 2,000 to 3,000. But this shows all of the infantry companies in formation with the staff officers. The tents are laid out behind them. Anyone want to take a guess of who this group of individuals in the front are? Officers, officers is a good guess, but wrong. It's the band. And one of the most common instruments that Civil War bandsmen carried was this thing that looks like a French horn, but not with a curve. It's a straight up thing, and it was called a sax horn, precursor of the modern saxophone. And the reason why it was so popular is because when the bandsmen played it, you blew into it, but the mouthpiece went over your shoulder facing behind you. And in the Army, that makes great sense. That means everybody marching behind you can hear the music and stay in step. <laughs> Now, as the war went on, uh, Minnesota regiments were raised. Some Minnesota regiments were discharged. There are a couple of the later regiments that don't really ever get really deeply into the conflict. There are other regiments that fight in some of the worst engagements of the war. Fredericksburg, Antietam, uh, the Siege of Vicksburg, Gettysburg, First Bull Run, Second Bull Run, Seven Pines. But there are others that mostly spend their time either doing garrison duty in the South or in the West, or participating in little known actions like um, Spanish Fort in Alabama. So these are the discharge papers for Private Thomas Johnson, 
who enlisted in 1864, served one year with the 9th Minnesota and mustered out at Fort Snelling on the 24th of August, 1865. And for those of you who are interested in doing any further reading on Minnesota in particular, there are some of the best books recently written about it. Some deal with particularly one regiment or another, and some deal with Minnesota's contribution as a whole. This book down here towards the bottom, Minnesota and the Civil and Indian Wars, 1861-1865, is a massive three-volume compendium that was published under the auspices of the state government in the last century. Um, it would sound like it's really boring reading because it's basically letters and official reports and such. Uh, there's some incredible stuff in there. There's a great deal of just human interest stuff. And a lot of those we have at our library at the Historical Society. So if you're ever interested, you've got an afternoon to kill, you can always come on over and check them out. So that concludes my presentation today. Anybody have any comments or questions? You can access more information about KSMQ on Facebook and at ksmq.org.